are, we are excited. We are launching a new series today called Disciples. And this is something that's just been stirring on our heart. Yes, I love this graphic. It's like the city coming through my face. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I love it. Um, and for those of you who are constantly wondering, like, if we have a constant theme of yellow in all of our graphics, no, we just need new projectors, okay? <laughs> Feel free to donate. We need new screens for our projectors. We don't just like yellow in everything we do. Just gonna throw that out there. Praise the Lord. Um, won't he do it? Um, so we're, we're gonna start just kind of this series this morning talking about what does it mean to really be a disciple? What does it mean to make disciples? What does this look like? You know, we kind of been talking to some people about this and the interesting thing about like discipleship is is people in LA, it's, <laughs> how do I say this? It feels like either people are kind of like, that's so foreign and I don't even, like I don't have time for that. Or there's kind of this mentality of, dude, I have been so hurt by something called discipleship. It was so weird and manipulative and I'm afraid of it. And so there's kind of this whole spectrum. And so we're just coming back to the word of God. It's what we do. We're just going to come back to the word of God. We are going to get God's perspective. What, what, is it, what does it mean to be a disciple? How do, we, how do we be a disciple? How do we make disciples? What does that really look like from a kingdom perspective? Let's just peel away all the past, the experience, the whatever baggage that might come with. And we're just going to get heaven's perspective on this. Amen? So, you know, kind of we're just going to start really basic here. Just this thought of like, what does it mean to be a Christian? And uh, look at this beautiful family walking. You guys are just lovely. Hi. Didn't mean to call you out. You just look so lovely, all of you walking in. Cute kids. Making it. Um, I mean, somebody shows up with kids to church. I just feel like we should applaud them all the time. I'm like, that's, a, that's hard work. It's hard work. Good job, Dad. Um, <laughs> he's probably like, I hate you. Um, I'm feeling it, though. I feel it. It's like serious business. But, you know, this term Christian, um, that term Christian wasn't actually even used until somewhere in the first century, long after the death and resurrection of Christ. So it wasn't even a term that Jesus ever used. And the, the term Christian, you know, um, was given by Romans and Greeks of the time. It was a word that they imposed on the followers of Christ trying to explain who these crazy people were. And so it was just a term that was given to these followers of Christ. And it's not a bad term. It's not a bad term at all. Um, we use it. But what I want us to do, you know, because if you've, most of us have probably checked the box, like, what religion are you? Christian or whatever. And, and one third of the planet professes to be a Christian. So that's great. But what does that even mean? And, um, and so I want to look closely at what then did Jesus, what is the term Jesus used, and what was his intention in that? And um, when you look throughout the scripture more than 230 times in the Gospels and Acts, you're going to find the word disciple. Jesus came to make disciples, right? Jesus came and gave his entire life in ministry in calling and the making of disciples. And then the Great Commission at the end, he rallies us all together and he says, now go and make disciples. And so it's important that we get our head around what this ministry and mission that Jesus had and that we're to have. And so um, the, the word disciple, I'm going to butcher it, methetes or something in Greek, something along those lines, okay? Um, but this word had a lot of cultural context in Jesus's day because it was, it was an understood concept that a disciple was was more than a student, it was more than an apprentice, it was somebody who would give their whole life to study, to learn, to absorb, to walk with, to glean from the master with the hopes that one day you would become the exact replica of the master. So this was, this was already in culture and society when Jesus was using this term. Um, I'm gonna give you the definition a disciple is a dedicated follower of Jesus, follower or adherent of a teacher, an apprentice, someone actively imitating both the life and teaching of the master, a deliberate apprenticeship which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master, to be constantly associated with the master's reputation and set of views, and then um, 
the disciple desired to learn not only the teaching of the rabbi, but, the, but to imitate um, the practical details of their life. A disciple did not merely attend lectures or read books. They were required to interact with and imitate a real living person. A disciple would literally follow someone in hopes of eventually becoming what they are. So it's this concept of, as a disciple, giving yourself fully to the life, the teaching, the thinking, the, the behavior, the patterns, the mentality, the perspective of another, not just that you're kind of like them, it's that you literally become them. That was the mentality, that you would carry the very essence of the, the master, that you would walk in the very same authority, that you would, you would be that person's exact replica when they've gone. That's incredible. Uh, Bible scholar William Keynes defines a disciple as this. A disciple is one who responds to the call of Jesus in faith, resulting in a relationship of absolute allegiance and supreme loyalty through which Jesus shares his own life and the disciple embarks on a lifetime of learning to become like his master. It's not like a, hey, I went through a six-month discipleship. It's a lifetime of following Jesus and being transformed in his image. It is a lifetime of being a student. It is a lifetime of transformation. This is what Jesus invited us into. And so if you think about it, right, what's the difference between a believer and a disciple? And are there two different tracks of Christianity? These are questions I ask myself. I'm always like, hmm, I always like to find anywhere where there might be like contradiction in scripture and like sit on it for a minute and think about it. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys do that, but I'm like, what is, the, what is the difference then? Because you'll notice Jesus didn't walk up to, to Peter and Andrew and, and the disciples. He didn't walk up to them and say, believe in me. He walked up to the disciples and said, follow me. Be my disciple. Isn't that interesting? What's the gospel we preach in America? Is it believe in him or follow him? What's the difference? Because we know Acts 16.31 says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So salvation has nothing to do with our performance, our behavior, our maturity, our lifestyle, our choices. Salvation has nothing to do with that. That was all taken care of by Jesus, right? 100% of the work was done on his end. Salvation is a free gift you get by just believing and receiving. So there's no effort on your part. So you could live a horrible, sinful life, and in your last moments, you could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you could be saved, right? Has nothing to do with your behavior. But Jesus didn't just call us to be believers. Believing is the doorway into a whole new lifestyle. Believing is simply the, the first step into a whole new kingdom and culture that you and I belong to and are part of. We were never meant to stay at believing. Believing was merely the open door to walk through to everything that's new, right? Salvation is free, it's unearned, it's a gift, but being a disciple is costly. The ball is in your court, not Jesus's. Now hear me in this. I've had a lot of time this week to think about this, where I think about, oh my gosh, like looking through the, the passage we're going to look at this morning, so many times I'm like, you know, wrestling through this and it's like, oh, I don't have that kind of energy. I don't have enough time in the day to be that kind of disciple. I want to be. Anybody ever feel like this? If I just had more time, I could be such a better Christian. <laughs> Nobody? Okay. One, what, like I clone myself and one of me just like sits at the feet of Jesus all day and the other one's like dealing with kids and handling life. You know what I mean? Yes. I always remind Hona, Proverbs 31, you know, Proverbs 31 woman. And like, I was like, hey, you want a Pro Proverbs 31 wife? You better get her some helpers. Because she had helpers. She had servants. 
I gotta be a Proverbs 31 woman. Get me some help. Um, <laughs> but when you get stuck, and when we're going to talk through this passage today, I want you to think about this. Yes, it's costly. Yes, it's hard work. Yes, it's choices. It's all those things. But, 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 but. What we bring to the table is our surrender and our willingness. And the Holy Spirit does the work. You will never have all the things to fix yourself and make yourself a super saint. Like, no, the Holy Spirit does that. We behold him, and in the beholding, we are transformed into his image. So don't try to take on the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't try to be like, I got to fix it all. You just come, and but you got to bring full surrender. You have to bring full allegiance. You have to bring full vulnerability. You have to bring full loyalty. When you do that, then the Holy Spirit can begin to transform and work his nature and his essence in your life. Okay? So keep that in mind as we're hearing this this morning. But I want to say this. I, I feel in a lot of ways the church has reduced the gospel to the gospel of salvation and not the gospel of the kingdom. And what we've done is we've filled churches with people and told them, believe in Jesus. That's beautiful. But we didn't actually tell them what Jesus told people, which was, throw down your net and follow me. Come spend time with me. Come learn the ways of the kingdom. Come be my disciple. And disciple is to, to fully give yourself to the study and learning and apprenticeship of the master so that you become like the master. Because what happens is if we don't do that, we have a bunch of people walking around saying, I'm a Christian, yet they don't smell like one, talk like one, look like one, move in power like one, have authority like one. And then we sit and we're like, what's wrong with us? I mean, I've been here. Why, do I, why is there miracles in other countries and not this country? I, I've, we wrestle through these things. And I feel like there's this awakening where the Lord is bringing us back to the undiluted gospel. And I'll tell you, a part of even why we're, we're wrestling through this topic and getting God's heart is we absolutely, it's, it's happening all over the city. There's a move of God that's happening. There's an awakening that's happening. And I wonder if the churches in Los Angeles, if we are ready for the harvest. Because what are we going to do if in next year a million people in L.A. get saved? Are we going to, to turn around and disciple and pop out a bunch of hip, cool, non-powerful, religious, I'm a believer Christians? a little too honest? <laughs> or are we going to truly have a culture where we are going to raise up disciples of Jesus Christ? People who know the kingdom, people who understand how to follow Christ, truly. But we can't give what we don't have. How are we going to lead somebody to somewhere we are, we are currently not ourselves? So we ourselves must truly become disciples of Christ if we're going to have real authority to help disciple industries, disciple nations, disciple a city, disciple our own children. We ourselves must be disciples, first and foremost. Amen? So you'll notice all throughout Scripture, there's no, like, two tracks of Christianity there's not the normal people, we're just the believer track, and the extra credit disciple track. <laughs> There's not. Yet we, fit, we live like there is, you know? Like, it's not just, I'm a believer, I'm a, I love God, I believe in God. You know, there's not that track, and then the, like, super saints, extra credit Christians that are like, whoa, they're like disciples. <laughs> they got time. There's not two tracks of Christianity. Jesus never actually, anywhere, anywhere when you study scripture, there is no inclination, there is no reason in anything Jesus ever says or does to believe that there's two tracks offered in Christianity. 
Christianity or Christianity light. There's no two tracks. There's one. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then he goes right into and pick up your cross and follow me. You know, it just, it's unless you be born again. I mean, it's, it's this one linear journey that following Christ looks like something. And there's real fruit and there's real power, but getting there looks like something. And so that's what we're going to, we're going to dive into today. Okay, buckle up. Um, we are going to be in Luke chapter 14. What's happening in this um, scenario, we're brought into a story where Jesus is surrounded by this large crowd of people. People are loving him. I mean, there is buzz about Jesus. People, I mean, his likes on social media are blowing up. I mean, he is like a blue check. You know, I mean, he is like Jesus has the people, okay? Obviously paraphrased. Um, so there's all this buzz and energy about Jesus. There's a large crowd swelling around him. People are talking about him. Who is this Jesus? What is he talking about? What's his message? I mean, his church is full. His church is full. People are looking for an encounter. People are looking for a miracle. People are curious. All these people are pressing in. I mean, this is like, a minister's dream. It's like, oh my gosh, there's all this hunger. The whole city has come out. Everybody's pressing in. And you'll notice, interestingly, Jesus doesn't do what maybe some churches would do, which is do whatever it takes to get the crowd to come back. What? <laughs> I love this church. Just want that on the record. <laughs> also, shout out. I think we have people like tuning in today from Florida and North Carolina and all over. We love you. We're glad you're watching. Glad you're with us this morning. So, Jesus, you would think in a scenario like this that the game plan would be do what hey, people are kind of interested in God, do whatever it takes to bring him back. Jesus, don't be talking about sin. Come on, Jesus. Don't offend them. They're here. Make them feel good. Give them a feel-good message. Give them some donuts, Jesus. Like, you know. <laughs> we have donuts. It's the only way I can get my kids to church, let's be honest, right? <laughs> you would think that Jesus would go that route. You would think Jesus would give the feel-good message. You would think Jesus would you know, be like, wow, they're interested. Let's kind of slowly ease them into this whole drink in the blood and the body. You know, like, <laughs> let's slowly ease them in. <laughs> but what I love about Jesus is Jesus could freaking care less about a crowd. He doesn't care. He was not motivated by human praise. He was motivated by what his father said. He was motivated by truth and love, not by what was cool and what was happening and what felt good. And so Jesus does the opposite of what most people would ever do. Instead of trying to get the crowd to come back, he literally has a super anointing to empty the room. I mean, he just like goes for the throat with this sermon that he just begins to drop. It's like all of this, and Jesus is not motiva motivated by that. He doesn't sugarcoat. He doesn't reduce the gospel, but he speaks truth and love. So that's what's happening here in Luke 14. Let me actually find Luke 14. Okay, so I'm going to read this to you. We're going to start in verse 25 through 35, and it says this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. 
Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. And then he just, for drama effect, adds the, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> and just walks away, right? And everybody's like, uh, 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 Jesus, you know, like, what? Um, interesting sermon choice, Jesus. He begins to outline in this passage the cost of being a disciple. Because isn't it true? We all want the fruit. We all want the benefit. We all want the power. We all want the authority of being a disciple. And he says, I want you to have that too. And I'm making a way for you to have that. But there's only one path to get there. There's only one path. And he begins to outline six things that are requirements or qualifications to being a disciple. And we're going to look at those. The first one, I love this. You'll notice he starts with, if anyone. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me. Once again, he's just nixing the whole, like, there's two tracks. This isn't the, like, just the pastors, the missionaries, the, relig the super, like, anointed, born under a special star people. This is, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother. What are you even saying, Jesus? <laughs> what are you even saying? Now, for most of us, because you know, if you don't come from a, a shame and honor culture, this doesn't even make sense to you. Jesus lived in his culture. It was a very strong shame and honor culture, meaning that how you as a son how you behaved, how you, what you chose to do with your life either brought great shame or great honor to your family. And you carried that very preciously in your heart. And you would do whatever it took to bring honor to your family. So to, to leave the family tradition or to not take on the family business brought great shame. to you. It was as though you hated your family. It was very serious. Now, we also know this about Jesus. Jesus loved to, to use parables and all kinds of like, um, ways of, of using language to bring a point in here. It's, this is hyperbole for you. Brought my glasses today. Um, <laughs> this is hyperbole. This is, this is exaggerated language to make a point. Obviously, Jesus doesn't want you to hate people. Everything else in his life and teaching points that we're to love people. So obviously, Jesus is not contradicting himself. But what is he saying? And what he's saying here is, you guys, I have to be in my own category in your life, I have to be number one that literally everybody else has to be here. And that might feel like you're hating your family. You have to be willing to be rejected by your, even your family, even the people that you love the most. I have to be number one in your life. So qualification number one is keep God first. Number one is keep God first. I almost put God as bae, but then I was like, I'm not sure everybody's going to get that. <laughs> So if you want to go ahead and make your number one God is bae, that's good. Before anyone else. Keep God first. Um, <laughs> and we have to really think about this. Is God actually first in my life? Am I more afraid of disappointing my spouse or God? Am I letting my parents or my children call the shots of my life over what God is telling me to do? Is God really first above everybody else in my life? Does God have the rightful throne and seat in my heart and in my life? Does the CEO of my company or my agent or my boyfriend or girlfriend or my mentor have more influence and authority in my life than God? 
Being a disciple means there's only one person on the throne of my heart. And that I'm willing to let God call all the shots, even if it costs me something very valuable, even if it meant costing me my family. That's intense. I'll make this really more practical. Putting God first means I'm not going to marry somebody I'm not equally yoked with. Oh, I got thrown in here. I'm not going to date somebody who's going get in my way, get in my way of my relationship with God. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to elevate people and their opinion. I mean, I. So often I'll hear people say, well, I have to do this because my manager, my coach, this is just the path I have to take for my career. But what is God saying to you? Well, I mean, I, God's saying this, but you don't understand, like business-wise, I have to do this. Whoa, we've got a problem. Is God number one? Because I'll tell you what, many times it's uncomfortable, but when you, you'll find this out as a disciple, right? When he's number one and you follow, he will... Always walk you through seasons where he has you do something very different than what you, should be, you think in your head you should be doing. But that's the only way to get you to, to the place where you could never get yourself. So to be a disciple, you absolutely have to keep God first. And you'll notice the end of that verse um, says, even my own life, hating even my own life. So we must be willing to trade in our will, our control, it's not like God's just my Sunday thing. It's not like, hey, God, you can have my whole life, but don't touch my career. God, you can have my whole life, but don't tell me who to marry. God, you can have my whole life, but not this thing. I'm going to call the shots there. You can't have two masters, right? <laughs> um. Or we bring certain demands to Jesus, and I'll tell you what, if I had a dollar for every time I heard this in L.A., and I'm like, I hope people are joking, because I hear this all the time. People are like, thank God I'm called to the bougie. I'm like, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> thank God I'm not called to the, you know, nations. Woo! I'm like, oh, you just wait. <laughs> That's like an invitation. You are, God is going to like, just wait. You know, you better repent quick. You're going to be scrubbing toilets in India somewhere in like three seconds. <laughs> but we don't bring these kinds of qualifications to God. I'll serve you as long as it looks like this. That's not a disciple. You're not the one leading. You're the follower. And the follower goes wherever he's going. Right? So... This, this place of keeping God first, it's above everybody else, above my own agenda. It's above myself, my own desires, my own agenda, my own flesh. It's giving it all to him. He's saying, listen, if you're not willing to sacrifice everything, you can't be my disciple. This isn't going to work. Number two, qualification number two, live dead. Verse 27 says, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. A true disciple willingly embraces a life of pain and sacrifice rather than always expecting pleasure. Dang. Now, I'm going to assume none of us have ever actually carried a cross that we were about to be murdered on. But we don't even have a grid for what this language meant in this day and time. I mean, this is... To us, we're like, oh, a cross, church, Jesus, yay. You know, like, that is not what that meant to them when he said this. It was a bloody, gory, brutal execution. It's like Jesus saying, unless you wear the noose around your neck and you drag your electric chair, you can't follow me. Excuse me, Jesus? What are you even saying? I mean, this is graphic language, right? Right? And I, I don't think Jesus is just saying, you know, using this extreme language to say, hey, guys, sometimes following me is going to be a little hard. 
You might be inconvenienced. It might rain in LA. Oh my God. Like, I don't think that's what he meant. Just throwing it out there. Have you ever heard somebody be like, I can't find a parking spot. It's like my cross. I'm carrying my cross in LA. And you're like, I don't think that's what that means. Um, this is intense, right? There's a real cost for, for following Jesus. And not only does it just look like surrender, it looks like death. Death to ourselves. Death to our agenda. Death to our flesh. It looks like death. But let me tell you what is on the other side of that cross. It's the resurrection power. It's the resurrection life. And it's the only way to get it is to go through the cross. The only way to walk in the supernatural, the only way to walk in the finished work of the cross, to, to walk with that kind of authority. Now, remember, these disciples were punks until they met Jesus. And then, because they fully surrendered and they picked up their cross and followed him, they were transformed into the most amazing fathers and mothers of the kingdom who transformed the world and birthed the global church. There's no way to walk in that kind of authority without the cross. The cross just wasn't for Jesus. The same path he took is the same path we take. It's in our surrender that we have authority. It's in our, our death that we have life. So many of us were trying to produce our own life and wondering why we're not having life abundant. And we're like, ah, like freaking out. The only way you get abundant life is to die. Die to your flesh, dying to your will, dying to your own timetable, your, how you want it and your agenda and your long list of everything he needs to do. I love lists. <laughs> the Apostle Paul understood what it meant to carry a cross. In Galatians, there's three verses. He says, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and its passions and desires. And then Galatians 6.14, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. One of the classic books on discipleship is The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You guys ever heard of that book? And Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during World War II. Um, because he opposed Hitler and the Nazis, he was imprisoned where he died before the war ended. And this is, I'm going to read you a passage of something he wrote. He said, the cross is laid on every Christian. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. You see, a dead man is a free man. When you're dead, you're not offended. When you're dead, you can't be bought. When you're dead, you can't be manipulated. When you're dead, you can't even be anxious or depressed because you're dead. <laughs> when you're dead, you can't be disappointed. You see, full surrender is the beginning of living abundantly where you're no longer bound to all the things that bind people. It cuts the strings off the puppet and you're now a free man. You're not bound to what society says. You're not bound to what the economy says. You're not bound to what doctors say. You're not bound to that can never be done before. You see, when you're dead, you are more alive than ever before. Hallelujah. You're fully free. And I'm telling you, this is the life we're called to live. Amen. Not bound to the things of this world, but fully, vibrantly alive and being the best versions of ourselves, full of the Holy Spirit. This is who we are. Qualification number three. It's the last part of that verse there. Um, I'll read it again. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
So it's not just carrying the cross, but it's following. That's important. You're not just walking around with your cross like, oh, you know, well, I give it all to Jesus, whatever. You know, no, it's not what that looks like. It's carrying your cross and following him. That means you're moving with him. There's action. You're following his steps. You're moving in unity with him. And, and number three is following him through relationship. Because a true disciple elevates relationship over religion. You see, in, in Jewish culture, when a rabbi invited somebody to be a disciple, I mean, you'll see this with Jesus and his disciples. They lived every day together. They broke bread together. They hung out together. They, you know, took turns going to the same bathroom. Weird to think about. They did life together. They were close. They had conversations. They, they knew each other's fears and secrets and, and dreams. They, they, they did life together. They had real relationship. And in that context, Jesus could influence. In that context, Jesus could adjust their thinking. In that context, Jesus could meet them in their everyday and they could be transformed. You see, we're called to follow him through relationship. And in that place, it, it's not just about doing good religious deeds, acting a good way, coming to church, pay your tithe, do your thing, boom. That's not what this is about. This is about having a living, breathing relationship where daily you are in step with him. Daily you are connecting with him. Daily you are following him. This is what it means to be a disciple. You are actively in pursuit of him through relationship. Number four, verse 28 says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Interesting story Jesus throws in there. Qualification number four of being a disciple is commit to finish well. Commit to finish well. A true disciple values commitment over convenience. You know, Jesus is talking about counting the cost, considering before you jump in. He's talking about building this tower, and I, I want to reiterate this. If you begin to count the cost and say, all the work I'm going to have to do to be a super Christian, I can't do it. This isn't about you bringing the resources. The Holy Spirit brings the resources. You, what we bring to the table is commitment, willingness, vulnerability, right? We bring surrender to the table, and the Holy Spirit brings all the things to work his nature in you. So when you're counting the cost, you're not counting the cost of, of you know, having to have a strategy of how to fix yourself or no. You are counting the cost of commitment. Am I going to be committed for the long haul? Am I in this for the long game? Because you know what? I, there's, a, there's a great... Um, a great quote, Billy Sunday, a professional baseball player and minister, he said, stopping at third adds no more to the score than striking out. It doesn't matter how well you start if you fail to finish. Isn't that sad but true? How many stories have we heard? I mean, it's Solomon in the Bible. How many people in the Bible are people we've watched their lives and they, it's like God did all this incredible work in their life and it was so amazing and then they just kind of lost it at the end like they let their heart grow cold or they they just started believing a lie or they just got bitter and offended get that bitterness out of there right like you got to deal with that stuff because you, you will sideline you it's a lifelong pursuit of following him it's not like i'm a disciple until i'm just not messy anymore now i'm like a good functioning christian so like i'm cool i go into christian coast mode There is no such thing as Christian coasting. There's no such thing as spiritual retirement. You don't stop growing. You don't stop evolving in, in, in pursuit of what he said. Didn't we just sing that this morning? Is that how that line goes? You don't stop being transformed. You see, disciples are in it for the end game. And let me say this. Let me say this. 
This is the part that breaks my heart where I see over and over and over again. I watch people who've been through all this craziness. And you can see it. You can see how God has been like lining everything up. Like we know that God works things all, to, you know, all things together for the good of those who love him. I watch it over and over and over again. I've seen this so many times where God has taken people on this crazy journey they didn't understand. And all of a sudden, boom, and suddenly... And suddenly, it all makes sense. And suddenly, there's this breakthrough. And suddenly, it's a whole new day. And it breaks my heart when people get all this way. And then they just decide. You know, if you think about the life of Joseph, all the crap he'd been through. The pit, Potiphar's house, being sold, like betrayal, in prison. If he would have in prison decided, you know what, God, I'm done. You failed me. Why did I even believe this dream you put in my heart? He could have done that. And you know what? He would have missed his moment where he was about to rule over an entire land and free an entire nation of a great famine. And I wonder how many people, you know, have a story like that where they miss it. They, they don't plan for the end game, and they don't keep working on their heart. So that little fox, that little root of bitterness, all of a sudden takes them out. Because they stopped being a disciple. They went into coast mode, and then this thing grew in them that was just destructive. My heart is that we would be a people who would have a commitment to an end game that we would think like legacy, that we would think long-term, that we would allow God to, to do everything he's trying to do in our life. He is the author and the perfecter. He is your creator. He knows what he's doing. His ways are better than our ways. But we must count the cost of continual following, continual trusting, and letting him work all things together for good in our life. There's and suddenlies all over the place that God wants to do in our lives. He's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd, and he, he leads you by still waters. Or there may be a season where he himself has led you through a valley of weeping, through a, a, the valley of the shadow of death. Don't stop there. Why would you even want to stop there? <laughs> Do not put your blinker on. Do not exit the road. Do not stop there. Don't stop and have a pity party. Do not stop and have a conversation with the enemy, what he'd like to tell you about God or about yourself or about how you've missed it. Do not consult your bank account. Do not consult anybody or anything but your good shepherd. And you stay on that path because what comes right after the valley of the shadow of death, there is a table sitting there waiting for you to feast in the presence of your enemies. Do not stop on that path. Don't stop. Don't stop in the third quarter. Don't stop. Commit in your heart. Jesus, I will follow you every day of my life, no matter how I feel. And let me tell you, there will be days where you do not feel like it. There'll be days where you'll be mad. There'll be days where you're just tired. Make a choice in your heart. Make a choice in your heart. I'm going to continue to trust. I'm going to continue to follow. I'm going to continue to be a disciple and let you work this out in me. I'm going I'm to commit to finishing well. Amen? Qualification number five. Verse 31 says, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Qualification number five is Full life surrender. Your victory lies in your surrender, period. Do not buy the lie of anything else. Victory lies in surrender. Listen, you guys, we are not going to be able to do this thing in our own strength. Everything in life is going to feel like 10,000 going up against 20,000. <laughs> I mean, if you're believing for God for, you know, anything impossible, anybody in the room, right? You can't do it in your own strength. So surrender to the king. 
Surrender to the king. Let him lead you. Don't try to do it in your own strength. Don't try to, to make it happen. Ooh, people love this one. We get a word from God, we're full of faith, and we're like, if I'm in the right place at the right time, <laughs> it's gonna happen. And we manipul manipulate, that's called spiritual manipulation, it's a form of witchcraft. We manipulate, we get our hands all up in it, we try to make things happen, and then it's a mess, and it's terrible, and we're like, ugh, have to deal with that. You gotta lug around your Ishmael when he was trying to give you an Isaac. Anybody know what that feels like? Let him do it. Full surrender. Full surrender. Full life surrender. It's exhausting to have two masters. You will always lose. You cannot be the master and him be the master. Just surrender. If we're to be disciples of Christ, surrendering to his path, his way, his truth is how you get victory. Listen. It's not like we're surrendering to, I don't know, some computer who's like, just has information but no emotion. You are surrendering to the Prince of Peace. You are surrendering to the King of Kings. You are surrendering to your good Father who made you, loves you, knows you, is so wise and brilliant, can see the future, can see your past, who is absolutely full of justice, whose plans for you are so much better than your plans for yourself. You're surrendering to perfect love. When we understand whom we surrender to, the fear of surrender begins to go away. I spent a lot of my time as a teenager in my early 20s afraid of surrender, so afraid of surrender, because I didn't fully trust. I could trust him with my life. I thought for sure I was going to have to wear long denim skirts and tennis shoes and my hair in a bun and be a missionary in a village somewhere if I did it. Death to me. <laughs> I kid you not. I have journal entries at like 12 years old. Like, God, I feel like you're calling me to be a missionary, but I just don't want to be ugly. I don't want to do it. Like, that, you know, I just had this like, <laughs> there was this particular uh, precious, precious woman who uh, came to speak at our Awanas. Anybody was in Awanas as a kid? Yeah. Awesome, the real Christians in the room, it's good. Um, <laughs> the only ones who know the Bible, I'm just kidding. Um, just kidding. Um, was in Awanas as a kid, and this woman came to, to share, you know, a, a testimony from the mission field, and she looked rough, dude. I mean, rough, you know? Like, I don't even know if she liked people. It was like, she was one of those missionaries that was like, definitely did not like Americans. And we all knew it, but she was kind of precious, but tough and like leathery and had the long denim skirt and the tennis shoes and you know, and just was like talking to us about, we almost died a thousand times, you know, and like telling those stories. And we're all like sitting there as kids, like, I'm like so intrigued and I wanna follow Jesus, but I'm so scared of you, you know, and I don't wanna be mean and angry when I'm like your age, you know, and I just, I, I remember that wrestle in my heart of thinking, if I surrender to Jesus, this is what my life's gonna look like. I mean, that went in deep. I'm gonna be a nun. <laughs> this is not gonna work out, you know? And I was just like, <laughs> I don't know, I can't do it. And um, I remember that wrestle. And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I really, really, really began to understand it. It was so much fear every time I surrendered. But then the other side of that fear was so much life. The other side of that surrender was so many incredible like opportunities in life and authority and excitement and like wild things I could have never have like made happen in my own life. And I begin to trust and I begin to see, oh, surrendering to perfect love, I am never gonna lose. I only gain my lesser for his greater. We sang that this morning. Are you kidding me? Yes, I'll surrender my lesser. <laughs> Major upgrade. Right? Major upgrade. Full life surrender. Your victory is in your surrender. And then qualification number six. He ends with this. Verse 34, he says, salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? 
It's fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Just drops the mic and walks off the hill. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really should stop letting people into my brain. This is kind of embarrassing. Okay. Um, he begins to talk about being salty. Not the kind of salty you're thinking. He's talking about salt is good. We're called to be the salt of the earth. We're called, you know, salt is a preservative. We've talked about this before here. Salt is a preservative. Salt belongs in places that absolutely will decay if you're not present. The, the, the church, the people of God belong in places of brokenness, not running from them. We belong in darkness. We belong in chaos. We belong in, in places of despair and destruction. That's where we best shine. But what he's, he's pointing to this issue here, if we lose our saltiness, how can we be made salty again? We're good for nothing. We're not, we're not useful. We've lost our potency. You see, real salt cannot ever become unsalty. Pure salt. Pure salt will always stay salty. But what happens is, and, and in Jesus' day, this is, this is something that happened commonly where they were getting their salt from the sea, but when salt... When there is mixture added to salt, other minerals, other components added to salt, it looks like salt, but it doesn't taste like salt. It has all the exterior qualities of salt, but it isn't salty, and it's good for nothing. I don't need some extra grit and chunk in my dinner if it's not going to do something. You know what I mean? What's the point of it? You put that on meat, and it doesn't preserve it. So it looks like salt on the outside, but it's not salty. What takes away the power and the authority and the effectiveness of something is mixture, which is number six. Stay salty. Refuse mixture in your life. Refuse mixture. Purity breeds authority. Purity is the womb of your authority. Real effectiveness, real impact, real authority comes only through purity. And it's the bait of the enemy just to tell you, you know what, you'll have more influence if you just have just a tad of mixture. I mean, you gotta, you know, look like the world just a little bit. You gotta talk like the world just a little bit. You gotta, you gotta have a little bit of that in you if you're gonna have success. It's the age old lie. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That was the same lie. Hey, you know what? You can serve your God. You also got to bow to this thing. And they wouldn't do it. And the temptation was, if we have this mixture, maybe we'll be promoted in Babylon. And they said, you know what? We're not going to have mixture. We'd rather go in the furnace. And what happens? They get thrown in the furnace, but there's a fourth man there. And they don't get burned, and they don't get touched. And what happens when they come out of the furnace? They get promoted. So real promotion comes from choosing to not have mixture in your life. It comes from purity. It comes from keeping that place and saying, I'm gonna be right before God and right before man. I'm gonna do it his way, even if it's hard. Because that's where my authority is. That's what makes me potent in the world. That, that's, what, that, that's what distinguishes me from people who just maybe use the term Christian but have no real authority in their life. That's what distinguishes me. I actually shift the environment. I walk in real authority, right? That's not an arrogant thing. That's a, I know who I am as a son, as a daughter. I carry the kingdom of God inside of me because I am not walking in mixture in my life. It's not this like religious badge like, oh, I'm so pure and unmixed. You know, no. It's this place of full surrender before him and just saying, I'll do it your way, even if it's hard. I'm going to choose purity every time. I love this. Mixture drains our power and our effectiveness. And then he finishes his whole statement with this, you know, his whole sermon. And I'm just, I, I've been wrestling through this and wondering 
What is the church in Los Angeles going to look like? What is the church in America going to look like when we truly, and I think so many, there's so many incredible Christians all over the city, people that are on this journey that are true disciples that are pressing in, but what's it going to look like when we truly become disciples, when we truly say, God, we're going to do it your way? And it starts with us. We'll take ownership for ourselves. God, I, I want to fully surrender. I want to be all in. I don't want to, to live and preach and peddle a diluted gospel. I want to live and have dripping out of me the powerful, undiluted gospel in my life. I want to be a true disciple and follower of Jesus, not just a believer who knows all the right answers and does all the right things exteriorly. I want to have true connection, true surrender. I am willing to pick up my cross and follow you. I'm willing to make you number one. I'm willing to fully surrender. I'm willing to finish well. I'm willing to stay in this for the long game. I'm willing to continue to refuse mixture in my life. And anywhere where I mess up, I just get up and get back on track. That's so great about God. It's not like you lose like all this time and I have to do all this stuff to prove to him I'm like so ready to be a disciple now. No, you just get up and get back on track. And he's like, great, let's go. I have awesome things for you. So Jesus, you know, he was never motivated by the crowd. He came and he invited us into this kind of life of being totally sold out and transformed and radically committed disciples. And I'm going to end with these two verses. John 13, 35 says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. And then John 15, 8, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You see, disciples look like something. There's real fruit. There's real fruit. There's, there's evidence. People should be able to see us and say, they don't just talk to talk. Those people are the real deal. They are disciples. They, they look and taste and smell and talk and act like love. Wow. You know, I, when I first, um, in my early 20s, when I, I first, I lived in Kenya for a few years. Some of you guys have heard this story. And it, it caught me by surprise because when I was meeting people, it was like in 2001, don't count how old I am. Um, and I was meeting people, and people would introduce themselves like this. They would say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm a Christian. Awesome. Nice to meet you. That's amazing. Hi, I'm so-and-so. Um, I'm a Christian, and I'm really hoping to be born again soon. Okay. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm born again. Okay. And I knew there was like, I was like, what? I, I mean, this would happen all the time. I remember asking some pastors, being like, what is that? And they began to explain to me. They said, you know, we, this is a, a big part of our culture, and it was at that time, this is a big part of our culture where, you know, somebody can say, I'm a Christian because they, they know Jesus is the way, they believe that, they, you know, intellectually, they believe that Christianity is the right way, Jesus is the right way, but they're not really ready to surrender their life totally to Jesus yet. I mean, literally, I had somebody introduce himself to me and say, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm really hoping by this summer I'll be a born again. And I was like, what in the world, Right? And they, I began to understand because part of what was my experience at that time was just taking in the power that the church was walking in there, the miracles, the signs and wonders, the, the respect they had. Like there was, there was no mixture. And I'm not, I'm not saying we should take on that approach, but it was interesting to me that there was a, a distinction between we're not going to call ourselves something unless we're willing to pay the price for it. And those who were paying the price, let me tell you, they were salty. They were salty. I went there to get some salt on me. I went there to say, I, I need to see, I want that in my life. I want to know Jesus like you do. And I'm excited because I think we're in a time, you guys, where we are about to see the greatest move of God we've ever seen. And you and I are dropped right in the middle of it. And we are disciples. And I want to encourage you, if you've kind of been like, I don't know where I am on that path, like really wrestle this out in your heart. And you say, God, I truly want to be your disciple. I don't want to just be 
a saltiless fleck of salt. Is a fleck a thing? <laughs> Flake of salt? What is a salt? Grain of salt. Thank you. <laughs> you know, if you just leave me alone for a minute, sometimes I get there. Um, God, we want to be salty. We want to walk in the power and the authority. We want to walk in the freedom. We want to walk in everything you have created for us to walk in. And God, we're willing to take your path to get there. And I feel like just like Jesus, you know, walked up to the disciples and said, follow me. I, I think about this sometimes. You know, I think, what if Jesus just parked his car outside? <laughs> it's always a funny thought. And just walked in. Like, where would Jesus park? But anyways, and he just walked in. <laughs> Probably not CVS. And he just walked in. <laughs> just kidding. I parked at CVS for like six years. Um, <clears throat> and he walked in and he preached to us. What would his message be? If he preached to us out of the Bible, out of the things he was preaching, like, would we receive it? Or would we be like, what is he even talking about? May we not have a Christianity that's so different than the one Jesus taught. May we truly carry the kingdom. May we truly be disciples. I mean, Jesus came to give his whole life to raise up disciples. And then he called us to go and make disciples. And I'm telling you, what, we are about to see it happen. But it starts right here. And it starts with us. Amen? Amen? Will you stand as we close? Jesus, you're amazing. Terrifyingly amazing. <laughs> God, we want to follow you with our whole heart and our whole life. God, we want to see your kingdom come to earth. And God, I pray that you would awaken us in this room to true discipleship. I pray that every one of us would truly get on the path of being your disciple, that we would follow your lead, that we would surrender, that we would let go, that we would give you the space, Lord, to just work in us and transform us and have your way in us. I pray, God, that we would take on the posture of a student and a learner. I pray, God, that we would commit to that for our whole life. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you have way more energy than we do and way better strategy than we do and way more solutions than we do and way better ideas than we do. And so, Father, we give you permission just to do what you do in our lives. God, you do what you do, but God, we, we want to do and we choose to do what we have to do, which is surrender and commitment and willingness to follow and willingness to obey and willingness, God, to let you in and have your way. So Jesus, I pray that there would be a move, an awakening of disciples all over this city, all over this nation, and all over the world. God, that we would become truly disciples and God, that we would... Um, Take the commission that you've given us, God, to go and make disciples in every arena of society, God, in every culture, in every space, Lord. God, I pray that you would teach us how to do it and deliver us of any past trauma of what discipleship looks like. I pray healing and freedom and courage and excitement into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys.